Hello Chem 20s, our lesson today is going to be on intermolecular forces. We're going to first compare the difference between an intermolecular force to an intramolecular force. Then we're going to look at the three types of intermolecular forces. Again, this video is going to come to you in two parts. Please make sure you're watching the parts in the correct order. So if we do a comparison here and we're going to look at our picture again i would take a picture i would write down all my notes first then go back and fill in the blanks and add extras if i say something that you want to add if we take a look at our picture of water here you will see that the intermolecular forces those are the forces between water molecules these are the forces that hold water together allows it to beat up on top of a surface gives it adhesion or cohesion when you see it bubbling over the top of a water glass and you can go wow the water's not even in the glass and it bubbles over the top intramolecular forces are the forces of attraction within a water molecule. So if we take a look at this molecule, right, there is an attraction force here that holds the hydrogen to the oxygen so it stays together. Now, if we were in person, I would say to you, which one do you think is stronger? And everybody goes, well, you wrote weak on inter, you wrote strong in intra, and I always go, give me an example. And the best example I can give you is, I've got a cup of water. So if I take a drink of water, at no time have I ever had problems pulling the water for, from my mouth from the water in the glass, which means the intermolecular forces, the forces of attraction between water molecules, yeah, there's an attraction there, but it's not terribly strong. You've never struggled pulling the water from your mouth and the glass. Now. Intramolecular forces, again, using my water as my example, never have you taken a drink of water and gotten only a mouthful of hydrogen. That would be silly. You get all of it, the hydrogen and the oxygen bonded together because the force within a molecule, intra, is stronger than the force between molecules, inter. Now, you've probably heard inter, intra before. For instance, internet, this is how you interact with people around the whole world. Where intranet, and it's not as popular anymore, is how you would interact, let's say, in a school or in a, a building, maybe a business, a uh, 20-story business or a building like uh, Wall Street, would be intranet. Now, also looking at intranet on here, we would see that ionic compounds, right? We have this attraction between the anion and the cation, and this is our little crystal lattice picture that you're very familiar with. And then of course we have also the sharing of valence electrons. So we're sharing here in our covalent bonds. Well, what we're gonna spend the rest of this lesson on is I wanna look at the three different types of intermolecular forces. We're gonna go in order. We're gonna go from the weakest to the strongest. So we're gonna start with London dispersion forces. Then we're gonna to go to dipole-dipole. Then we're gonna to go to hydrogen bonding. Our video is gonna end after London dispersion forces. And then video two is gonna pick up with dipole-dipole. So London dispersion forces. Now, this one is actually one of the easiest ones to talk about, but it also is a little complicated. So let's fight our way through this. We can also call London dispersion forces van der Waals or van der Waal forces. Um, this is when you get an induced dipole between nonpolar molecules. So remember, we've already had a lesson about polar, nonpolar, and this induced dipole is something that it naturally puts on itself. So if I take a look here, and you've copied the notes already, let's pretend I'm looking at helium, a noble gas. Helium doesn't want to bond with anybody because he's already got that perfect valence shell. And so when I have a balloon filled with helium, I have a, like a helium atom here and a atom here and atom here and atom here, but it's got these electrons clouds around it. But the thing is, the electron cloud is not perfectly even from side to side. 
there is sometimes a little lopsidedness. And so when the cloud gets a little lopsided, one side of this cloud will get a little bit more positive and one side of this electron cloud gets a little bit more negative. And when it gets a little bit more negative on one side of this electron cloud, that's where we pick up a slight negative charge when then the other side will be a slight positive charge. And we call this a momentary dipole. And we looked at dipoles when we were looking at polar compounds on the last set of videos. So what happens is this atom of helium now has a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side with a momentary dipole. Well, when this comes in contact or gets close to another helium, again, this slightly negative side is going to repel the electron cloud. And so this one actually picks up and the electron cloud moves a little bit and the electrons move far away because they're repelled. And so we again set up from a momentary dipole, now an induced dipole where one side's slightly more positive, one side slightly more negative. And between these two, we set up this momentary, very small intermolecular force called the London dispersion force, where there's this slight attraction between the positive dipole of one side and the negative the other. But again, this is very, very, very weak force. If you think about this, helium's a gas. So is this force strong enough to bond them together? No, remember what gases do. They travel in a straight line. They have great distances. They go past one another. So yeah, there's a slight attraction there, but it's not enough attraction to attract them to somebody else or to hold them there. They keep whizzing by like a normal gas would until it runs into an object or hits another helium atom. Now, the one thing I want us all to be clear of is, Every single compound, atom, molecule out there has London dispersion forces. Everything has it. But just because you have London dispersion forces doesn't mean that all London dispersion forces are the same strength. London dispersion forces are not treated equally. So the question goes, who has London dispersion forces? Everybody's got London dispersion forces. But if you were to rank them, that's where you have to know how do you tell the difference between these forces. So I have picked the halogens here and I picked them because they're all in the same family, but there's also something really unique about them. Yes, they're all diatomic. Yes, they're all linear. But the other neat thing is these guys, and I need a pen feature, are unique because in the column of halogens, this is where we have Hey, gases, liquids, solids. This is the only spot in the periodic table where you have all three different states of matter that are all same shape, same valence electron. They have share the same properties. So what I want to do is compare these three. And what I want to do to compare them is let's look at the number of electrons. So on your periodic table, I have taken the four halogens over here and I want us to look up fluorine. Fluorine is element number 19. Excuse me, fluorine is element number nine. Therefore, since I it has nine electrons, but we have two fluorines, so that means it's going to have 18 electrons. Chlorine is element number 17. Therefore, it's going to have 34 electrons, 17 electrons in one chlorine, 17 in the other. Bromine is element 35, so that's going to be 70 electrons. And then iodine is element 53, so that's going to give it 104 electrons. Now, what I want us to figure out here then is, well, what does that mean? So what happens is the electrons get larger. Well, everything has London dispersion forces, but the trick to this is they're not always equal. So what we're going to say is the greater the number of electrons, the greater the London dispersion forces. So London dispersion forces increase as the number of electrons increase. Well, let's compare our halogens again. I think this will make sense. 
Fluorine and chlorine are gases. They have the smallest number of electrons, which means they have the lowest number of London dispersion forces. So they're weaker than iodine, who's a solid. Well, think about this. Iodine's a solid because those forces of attraction are stronger, holding in and into that solid shape. Bromine would be a little weaker, so that gets it into its pouring shape where the atoms can roll past one another. And then gases are all free willy and they just bounce off everything and they have larger distances because they have less London dispersion forces because of that less number of electrons. Now, sometimes though, and this is where I'm going to point it out, we have to look at shape. And shape is important when we have to break a tie because sometimes we have a molecule and it has the same number of electrons when we're comparing it. A perfect example of this would be something like C5H12. This is an isomer. And I know we've been working really hard on isomers in our classes. And so what I want us to do is draw the three isomers of C5H12. There they are. Oh, gonna go bigger again. So here's our three isomers. Now, they will for sure have the same number of electrons because they all have five carbons, 12 hydrogens. That's a tie, but we can still rank these. And the easiest way to rank these is, pretend you're playing the worst game of Tetris ever. So you don't get to flip, turn, rotate, move around. You just get to push the down arrow. And we lump these guys all on top of one another. So if I take a look here at the first one, his rough shape is a rectangle. And if I push down and put another one below him, it's another rectangle. And then it's another rectangle. Well, with this guy, if I was to do it, I'm getting an E there, but I'm just going to leave it. His rough shape is this, a weird little Tetris piece. His rough piece is this, and this is our fun one. This is our plus sign that when I'm done drawing is not going to look like a plus sign. That one's better. Now, the question is, which one of these has the stronger intermolecular force? Well, when we think about it between molecules, this one has a lot of between surface area. So this one's going to have the strongest intermolecular force. This one's going to have more London dispersion forces than the rest because between these two molecules, there's a greater attraction. Now, in the second case, there's one spot here and one spot here. And most people would say, well, then that makes that a tie. But it's not a tie because if you think about this other attraction, there is a one carbon gap between here and here and here and here. On this example, there is a two carbon gap between one carbon two between here and here. This is a bigger gap. So there's less attractive forces here. So if I was ranking these one, two, three strongest to weakest. So shape plays a point. And the line I like to say is, whoever has the greater stackability has the strongest intermolecular forces. So one for sure has the strongest because it has great stackability. It's like your arms, lots of combination here. Two has the next highest stackability because it's only touching in one spot, but they're only one carbon away. And three, this guy's dead last because they're touching in one spot, but they are two full carbons away. 